It, it really, like after the show yesterday, you know, obviously a long day. We were out at District E for the whole thing. We were on set with Russell, do the show, talk about it all, li- listen back to the interviews that take place, uh, you know, while we're, we're playing them back. And as a result, like you're kind of thinking about everything that was said. And, and there's a couple of, of clips, a couple of things that were said that really stuck with me. And ironically, the two that I want to talk about, the two that I think stick with me the most are one thing that's said by Ted Leonsis that we're going to talk about uh, in 10 minutes and one that was said by Wes Unseld for all of the really encouraging things and, and interesting answers and things we learned about Michael Winger and Will Dawkins. It's actually the incumbents that I think said the most interesting basketball related things. And it's probably because like I have full faith in the guys that were hired uh, based off their track records, based off talking to them, that they're going to figure stuff out. And also they didn't offer a lot of specifics on anything because they just got here. But Unseld as the coach had certain basketball adjacent thoughts that I thought were worth, you know, parsing out. And when we talk about whether or not Ted Leonsis is going to give the full authority for a breakdown or, or a tear down or whatever direction these guys want to go, I thought Ted said something really fascinating uh, that we'll play for you in, in 10 minutes. But the, the bite from Unseld was when I asked, he mentioned that this phrase a couple of times, but it, the first and most notable is when I asked him about Bradley Beal. Because I, I, it's not Wes's call, nor is he going to say, like, yeah, we need to move on from Bradley. He's not going to say that. And the big question for me uh, is kind of the same question that I'm sure uh, Michael Winger and, and Will Dawkins will have for Wes, which is, if we're going to be a championship-caliber team, what's Bradley's role in that? How do we use him? What is it that we have not been doing right with him that we all agree he's a superstar and, and is an excellent, excellent NBA basketball player, but you won 35 games last year. How do we, how do we fix that? And so that's essentially what I asked Unseld, and here is what he said yesterday. Well, you know, obviously we want to make sure we, we can put out the most talent. And, you know, those three guys you spoke of are a big piece of that. Um, you know, I think Kuz, KP, had, had really good seasons. To your point, Brad probably had one of the most efficient seasons of his career. I think finding that balance of, of scoring, um, you know, being a facilitator, we're asking him to do a lot. You know, the, the underlying issue is making sure those guys are available, um, you know, to perform at a high level. Um, but I do think, you know, modern, modernizing our style, He's got to shoot more threes. Um, uh, he's shown in the past to, to be able to do that. And I think get back to that, um, you know, getting out in transition, uh, being more dynamic and playing um, in the open floor would help him. Uh, but to do that, we have to make sure we get stops and have the ability to get out and run. That phrase modernizing our style is fascinating to me as an avid NBA fan and observer. And specific to the threes, obviously, what does that actually look like? And can Bradley Beal do it? I I think there's two ways in which Bradley needs to change his game for the better to get those threes. These are not things that I don't think he's aware of. It's certainly things that I would hope he and Drew Hanlon, his his personal skills trainer, who's as good as it gets, are working on this offseason. But traditionally, and kind of when Bradley came into the NBA, this was still true, so much of pick and roll basketball was, you know, kind of uh, vertical, right? So you you take, let's say you're you're going center pick and roll. So you're on the the middle of the floor. The screen gets set on your your defender as the ball handler as Bradley, um, right at the three point line. What do you do? You go hard off that screen. You try to get vertical to the rim. If you you see that the defender has dropped well enough or is playing in drop coverage, you take a pull-up jump shot and you get that nice, efficient two-point bucket. And Bradley Beal has done, made a lot of those in his career. He's excellent at it, and he should take those with regularity. However, what do we see now? We see a more horizontal pick-and-roll or the pick-and-roll starting higher up the floor where when you come off that screen, now you're taking a three. You either get separation horizontally and you kind of sidestep instead of taking your one dribble pull up. It's a it's a side dribble pull up 
and that's now a three instead of a long two. Um, or you you kind of snake the screen, come back, and instead of when you snake the screen, so basically you, let's say again, the pick's being set so that when you use it, you're going left. You then cross back over right, um, and as your defender kind of chases you around, and you have space in front of that that second defender, the big defender, now you see guys, like Harden is, is so good at this, snake all the way back around behind where they started with a step back three. Like, that's the kind of stuff that can get you more threes. The other way in which Bradley has gotten a lot of him off in his career is playing off the ball more. And that's something that I just think that he needs to do. You obviously want the ball in his hands, but can he play more, not all the time, because he is a, a solid ball handler, but can he play more like a, a J.J. Redick used to play or a Ray Allen used to play or these guys that worked off the ball, off screens, and maybe you modernize it with a dribble handoff type of game. And so instead of pick and roll, it's dribble handoff, but you need a big to play off of with that. A, a big who's an excellent passer and can read screens or read the, the defenders and get a lot of, uh, or set, you know, set quality screens, make a lot of decisions and not just see that two man game, but see the entire floor in case someone's sleeping on the backside, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's also obviously different ways you can generate threes. Golden State uses a lot of split action. You need another great shooter to play off of. So can they use Beal and Kispert more to put defenses in conflict in the same way that you know Miami uh, does it with with Duncan Robinson and Gabe Vincent at times? You know they're running plays in the fourth quarter of the NBA Finals for those two because the threat of them shooting is so great. But they've got to have the personnel as well to do that. You you need more shooters. Um, no one, Monte Morris and Bradley Beal doing that is not going to get Bradley Beal open looks because no one's scrambling to cover Monte Morris. You also need, you know, they, obviously Miami does it with Bam Adebayo handling the ball. Well, you need a, a big who can make those decisions. And for as skilled as Porzingis is, that's not his cup of tea. It's not Kuz's cup of tea either. Um, so do you have the, the big that can kind of be the partner? for Brad and anybody else who wants to do that. Draymond plays that role in Golden State. If Brad winds up getting traded to Philly, he will fit in masterfully with Joel Embiid because Joel is that guy. Screener, I mean, when J.J. was there in, in Philadelphia, that was one of Reddick's, if not his single highest scoring season, it's one of them, um, because he was able to play the, the dribble handoff game so well, not, not that he was a primary ball handler, but Joel becomes the primary ball handler, and the... The, the shooting threat of a guy like Redick was enough to generate an entire offense around. And so with Brad, who is far more skilled in terms of his off the dribble creation and the types of things he can do better as a playmaker than some of the other guys that I mentioned, um, especially a guy like, let's say JJ. Um, and for you're also asking him to score 10 points more per game. Can you, can you create those opportunities? Can you modernize in that way? And I think there's a lot of modernization of the organization in general that needs to happen, training, medical, all those kinds of things, data uh, analysis. They're, they're, they're still working on fleshing out that department. Um, they've certainly made strides, but I, I think that Michael Winger will bring in a whole new perspective. Um, and that's also going to involve resources that I don't think have put forth that yet because I don't think they were asked for. I think Ted, especially someone with Ted's background, is going to be all gung-ho about technology and, and integrating it into the, the club. But he's got to know what to buy. And Michael Winger comes from L.A. under Ballmer, and they bought everything because that's that's what Steve Ballmer wanted. And so, long, long winding story short, they need to rethink how they play basketball. That involves who is playing. It involves how they use the pieces that they have. And for the head coach to be saying that, I do find kind of fascinating because he was the head coach last year. So my question, and ultimately the question going forward is, why, if Wes knows this, didn't it happen sooner? Was it organizational obstacles, other people pushing in opposite directions? They weren't all pulling on the same rope. Uh, the front office wanted to do one thing, and Wes had to listen because those were his bosses. Now he's got new bosses, and he'll be able to do something else. That's possible. Were the players tuning Wes out? If they are, we're going to find out who's got more power the coach or, or the players, what's more important. And depending on the player, it's probably going to change the answer. But also from a cultural standpoint, if you got players who are just willing to flat out ignore the coach, 
maybe Michael Winger and Will Dawkins go, that ain't going to work, not here, see ya. So there's, there's a lot of questions that remain answered as to why, but I appreciate that Wes Unseld has articulated very clearly the what that we need to see moving forward, uh, specific to Beal if he's here uh, and they want to win more games, but I think also in general that is a larger statement about the identity they're trying to build, who they want to be, and how they want to play basketball. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. When we get back, will Ted Leonsis let Michael Winger and Will Dawkins tear it down or do something else, and whatever it is that they, they deem uh, the best path forward for this team? Grant and Danny asked Leonsis that yesterday. His answer was very, very interesting. You'll hear it next. And back to Ted Leonsis. So... The Wizards owner sat down with Grant and Danny yesterday at District E, and they did a, a great job with the interview, uh, fully endorsed going and checking out the podcast uh, for those guys or, or on their, their feed, listening to the full interview. But it is a trepidatious topic for Wizards fans to think about whether or not Ted Leonsis will actually let Michael Winger and Will Dawkins tear this thing down if they ultimately decide that's what they want to do if they come in and they're like hey we gotta we gotta start over will ted let them or will he put this foot down and be like no i want my franchise player my franchise player is bradley beal you are not allowed to to touch him do not think about trading him and the unequivocal answer that michael winger gave at the podium yesterday was yes i have the power to do that and he did it sitting a foot and a half from Ted Leonsis, who did not object whatsoever. And what I thought was interesting in his interview with Grant and Danny, when Grant straight up asked him, like, will you have the power or will you give these guys the, the green light, is Leonsis did not only say yes, but kind of expanded on it based off history. Here's Leonsis. Just look at my track record as an owner i mean what did we do with the caps we traded all of our players and went young and did the right right era started what did we do with the wizards when i first came here we traded three all-star players got the first round pick in the draft and rebuilt you know we've made the playoffs five of the last 10 years injuries has played you know pretty serious role in there but i'm not afraid of a rebuild you know, at the same time, what I told them is um, it's a blank canvas for you. This is our organization. These are our players. These are the contracts. Come on in, assess, review, come to me with the plan, and you're accountable. You're responsible, and I'm um, up for whatever you tell me. This is what's going to get us to that right place. And they're totally empowered. And that's what's excited them about coming. No one wants to come and be the number one person for a team thinking that you're not going to be making the ultimate call. And so Michael has my assurance, all my partners' insurance, that here's the keys. Get us there. I don't know how you march more clear than that. I know that's not in many ways the answer that some fans want in that he doesn't say there's a mandate to blow it up. That's what some some people, um, and I want to take calls next for sure on what the plan should be, 301-230-0980. But some people want to say that's not enough. I want a mandate to tear it down. But that's that's not where Ted's at. Um And there was another part of the interview that I thought was really interesting and I think eye-opening, and I'll just summarize it, um, because basically he said, you know, we've been successful in all of these other places. And he said this in in the the press conference yesterday, but he expounded on it with Grant and Danny. We've been successful with the Capitals. We've been successful with the Mystics. We've been successful in e-gaming. We've been successful in acquiring a television network. We have won everywhere, and not just won, We have been continuously competitive, right? Um, Winger used the term yesterday, generational competitor. And that's what they've been. Again, they haven't won as much as I think a lot of us think they should have. 
but it's hard to win championships. Should they have more than one with Ovechkin? Probably, but they got the one, and they've been right in the mix for the better part of two decades. Uh, they have been consistently excellent with the Mystics, including a championship and another finals run in which they lost. Um, I know nobody cares about the e-gaming stuff, but like, would you rather them be good at it or suck at it? Like, Prove to me that you can build a winner in another business, in another model, in another way, in another industry. And they've done it. So, like, is that going to help you win an NBA championship? No, but it it proves that, like, and, and the thing is, forget proving to us. It proves to Ted, like, you got to keep trying. What you're doing is not right because you figured it out in these other lanes. And, and what Ted said to Grant when he pushed him, like, well, what's it going to take for the Wizards? Or why hasn't it worked for the Wizards? He literally goes, I don't know if I knew I would have done it by now. And I'm not in the business of, or in the habit of just forcing uh, compliments to billionaires for humility because billionaires and humility don't cross very often. But there's a level of humility in that statement that I appreciate. Like, hey man, like if I knew the answers, you think I'd be on yet another executive? You think I'd have zero championships, zero 50-win seasons, zero conference finals appearances in my ownership? No. The first step to getting better is acknowledging that you don't know what to do. Now, does Ted probably have some thoughts beyond that? Yeah, he knows some of the steps. Dude's been in the NBA for 20 years. Does he probably realize at this point that one of those steps is getting a star player and that's why he wants to be a destination? And does he probably realize that Bradley Beal's not that star player? Yes. Could he have recognized that a year ago and not given him a max contract with a no trade clause? Like that would have been nice. I don't know what the epiphany was, but better late than never. But at the end of the day, like the... There was a lot of trepidation around whether or not whoever he hired before we ever knew it would be Michael Winger and Will Dawkins, that whoever he hired would have the ability to actually make changes. And pretty instantaneously, I felt good about that. I think I probably said it the night that we stayed on an extra hour when Shepard was fired. You don't fire a guy, especially when you're someone who pays attention to the bottom line in the way that Ted Leonsis does, for better or for worse. When you run your business like, you know, a business and you pay attention to budgets and contracts and you actually don't like firing people, it's not a, it's not a fun game to you. It's, it's real human beings and, you know, an admission of a mistake on some level that you don't, didn't want to make. He doesn't fire Tommy Shepard unless he's ready to do something different. And he's not hiring people to come in and do the same, which would lead to the third quote of the day that I thought was the most interesting. And actually, Anthony, I think we can pull this in the break and have it ready next. But Michael Winger said, we're not running it back. He didn't say what they're going to do, but the reason Michael Winger's here is that if they simply wanted to run it back, they wouldn't have pushed out the last guy. And I think that's really important to remember. Even if they don't make massive changes immediately, it's a long-term plan for change. And I do think Leonsis both is serious about wanting to make changes and allowing them to do that and having the patience to allow them to do it correctly, which is essentially all you want from a sports owner. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. Take your calls next on what's next for the Wizards, 301-230-0980 plus. You'll hear that clip from Michael Winger with Russell and I yesterday here on the Hoffman Show.